Welcome to Almost Here, Round the Corner Future Technology Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies poised to transform our lives for better or worse are the focus of this podcast. Almost Here means these technologies are now here and starting to be used or just around the corner from Bitcoin to artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more. Coming to Dallas, Texas, September 14th, 15th, and 16th, 2018, the Blockchain and Future Tech Expo. This is going to be a gigantic conference of over 5,000 people. We're going to be talking about blockchain and its applications. We're going to be talking about quantum computing, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, and several other future technologies that are poised to and actually changing our lives as we speak. Here's why you should attend. As you may know, early adopters are the ones that investigated and profited from things like the gold rush in the 1800s, from the dot-com boom in the 1990s, from the internet boom in 2005, from the smartphone explosion in 2007, from the real estate boom that ended in 2008, and of course, from the Bitcoin boom that started in 2012. Early adopters act now. They don't wait till later. They go out west first, in their covered wagons, they find the biggest gold nuggets. If you consider yourself an early adopter and you want to find the biggest nuggets, then you owe it to yourself to attend this upcoming conference. Blockchain is going to affect how we control and store our medical data, how we send money around the world, how we bank, and more. But artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and cybersecurity will play a pivotal role in our lives as well. And that's why our next event, September 14th to the 16th at the Dallas Convention Center, is going to have not only 5,000 plus attendees, but we'll showcase blockchain, AI, cybersecurity, quantum computing, and more. You want to get in on the coming gold rush of future tech and opportunity as an early adopter. Don't be left out. To register, go to bftexpo.com. That's blockchainfuturetechexpo.com. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with Future Tech Podcast. My guest is Michael D. West the founder and CEO of Age X Therapeutics. Mike, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for coming. So, uh, you know, tell me, what is the premise of Age X Therapeutics? What do you guys do? Well, as the name would imply, uh, we're a biotechnology company, um, not, you know, focused on, uh, you know, some specific disease like uh, cancer or uh, heart disease, as many biotech companies are, but we're focused on aging itself, uh, the problem of growing old which many people don't think of as a disease, uh, but some of us uh, heretics in the field of aging research think of it as a disease, and so we're targeting aging. I know aging is a very, very tricky thing, and I know there's lots of angles that are people trying to work on. What are what are some of the common um, ways that companies seem to be approaching aging, and what's your way? How is it different? What's your approach? Well, you know, you know the, um, you're, you're quite right. And what flashed in my brain when you said that is this old, maybe tired metaphor of the blind people or masked people approaching an elephant. You know the story, right? So mm. you're blindfolded and one grabs the tail and says, an elephant is a piece of rope, you know, and one grabs uh, a leg and says an elephant is like a tree, you know, tree trunk. And then they take their blinders off and they all see then the elephant in the room, you know, the the real thing. And right. aging has been like that. So, you know, if you, you go back and look at it you know, maybe 100 years ago or maybe even 50 years ago, um, there was actually maybe a consensus that aging was just wear and tear. You know, things fall apart with time. Hmm. You know, your car gets old. Uh, your shoes wear out, as mine are right now. Uh, and, you know, isn't the human body the same thing? Um, that right. changed, uh, I think maybe, maybe in the sixties or seventies, scientists began to recognize, uh, that, uh, that's not how aging works. And we know that because, you know, the human species keeps going, right? We keep, we always talk right. about having immortality through your children. Well, there's actually biology behind that. And so some cells in our bodies are capable of perpetuating life, you know, for, I don't want to get into the evolution debate, but I personally believe that life's been perpetuating itself on this planet for, you know, many hundreds of millions of years. And those well, it has, otherwise age. we wouldn't be here. 
Yeah, yeah we wouldn't so, be here if it wasn't. Yeah. So life, life, you know, we're made of cells, and so that life has to have a way of escaping aging to perpetuate the species. And so scientists said, okay, so the, the you know, it, it's not that. What is it then? And then all these scientific tools came on board in the last 15, 10, 15 years, really powerful new new ways of looking at disease. You know, many scientists would say today, you know, we learn more now in a year than we've learned in the whole history of medical research. Uh, and that's that's probably underestimating how powerful these new technologies are. It's just amazing the interface of artificial intelligence and computer science and the modern DNA technology is what we can do. It just it boggles, well, it boggles my mind anyway. So with all this yeah, new we science, do. we we looked at this more precisely. And I would say, you know, in maybe five years ago, we were at that stage where, you know, one scientist was saying aging is free radical damage. You still hear that, by the way. Uh, hmm. Advertisements on TV, you know, free radical scavengers. Um, you know, the, the aging is uh, damage to the mitochondria, the little powerhouse, the battery in the cell, and the, you know the different approaches to aging. What you're seeing right, the, right the now, the shortening of telomeres, okay. telomeres, okay. which I played a big role in. You know, years ago I started a company called Geron, where we we proved the the role of telomeres in aging. So that was really hmm. my ballywick for for some time. And uh, but now what I, I would say we're just right now seeing the masks come off. And what I mean by that is aging researchers are just beginning to recognize right now the whole picture. There's a unification of our understanding of aging. So we're you know we're all seeing there's there's one elephant in the room. There's a biology really? of aging. And that is when it gets really interesting, because already we now understand aging enough. And this, hold on to your chair, okay? We can already reverse the aging of human cells in the laboratory dish. Really? It, it sounds spectacular, I know, but it's absolutely accurate. And the recognition that you can take even a cell from a 120-year-old person and like a time machine, reverse the aging of those cells by all known markers of aging is breathtaking. And so uh, we're now entering, you know, there's an inflection point. Some people predicted and said there'd be this singularity, you know, this inflection point where all of a sudden things dramatically change. Uh, that's the buzz right now in gerontology is uh, it's the field is entering a new era. And, of course, uh, with that will come, up, I think, a growing public appreciation of, wow, you can actually do something about aging. So what's this grand <clears throat> unified uh, picture look like? You know, Can you give some details for more of a layperson? Yeah, so I can. Um, it, it, so you mentioned telomeres and telomerase. So we're made of a lineage of cells that, as we kind of inferred uh, just a minute ago about, you know, you continue to perpetuate the species, right? You make babies, and babies are always born young. And we right. know the, at least one of the reasons for that, and that's that uh, the reproductive cells that make a baby, and then, of course, the babies grow up and make more reproductive cells and make more babies. Um, that lineage of cells, if you connected the dots, you know, uh, from generation to generation, uh, those cells have telomerase turned on. And telomerase simply put is a uh, is an immortalizing gene uh without it and most of the cells in our body as opposed to these reproductive cells uh have uh, cells in our you know bone and our blood and skin and brains and so on have turned this gene off and so uh this the this telomere clock then ticks like a burning fuse candle wick or something would be the analogy, I guess. Uh, without telomerase, uh, the telomeres shorten, and then that leads to uh, cell aging, and uh, the, the cells stop dividing. And so that's um, half of the story, uh, uh, precisely half, but that's part of the story. And well, one, um, one quick question on that. Um, yeah. What does telomerase look like in a baby versus um, an adolescent versus an adult versus an older person? Does it just get produced less and less and then stop, or what's the pattern? 
Yeah, it turns off, you know, you, you've probably, some people have heard the saying, you, we start aging actually in our mother's womb, and that's actually hmm. true. So the um, once, uh, you know, you have a fertilized egg cell, and then you got two cells and four, and the cells start replicating. Some cells say, oh, uh, I'm going to become a cell of the human body. And uh, and so this gene very early gets turned off. And uh, you have uh, the cells can replicate, you know, well over 100 times. And that gives the cells the ability to make a human body and for cells to replicate during our lifetime. But eventually, uh, all the cells in our body have, you know, a, a genetic time bomb in their DNA uh, that will go off uh, preventing, uh, you know, uh, us to live forever. Uh, it reminds me of, wasn't it Woody Allen in this movie where he was uh, a sperm cell? I can't remember which movie that was. I remember him dressed up in this outfit in the movie. And oh, I think some it's everything cells, you wanted to know about sex we were that, afraid to ask. Is, is that, was that it? And, um, you know, so you can imagine these cells, you know, talking to each other like that and some cells saying, oh, I'm going to become a sperm cell. And so those cells uh, maintain this immortalizing gene on so that they can continue this uh, indefinite stream of cell division that perpetuates the human species. So that's part of the story. The other part, which we've just um, begun to understand in the last few years, which is really, really important, and this escaped the notice of aging researchers uh, for some time, is that uh, life, uh, as it evolved uh, many hundreds of millions of years ago, uh, these simple organisms, let's take, um, I don't know if you've ever seen a flatworm uh, in freshwater streams. Sometimes you turn over a rock and you'll see these little, cute little worms that live under the rocks. They have two buggy eyes and they're really cute. And uh, right. these little right. flatworms are very, you know, primitive organisms. They have telomerase and all the cells in their body, but they also have another property, which we don't have, uh, in that they can regenerate. So if you cut their head off, the darn thing grows back. The head grows back. The head, the, the head that we cut the tail off will grow a new tail. And they have telomerase, and they have the ability to regenerate after damage uh, forever. And those twin properties make the animal immortal. It doesn't age. Uh, so years ago, a uh, scientist who was studying this, you know, uh, characterized this and said, you know, gosh, these, uh, these animals uh, they are immortal. Well, what's the difference between that and us? Well, we turn off this immortalizing gene and the cells in our body. That's part of the story, as I said. And then once the body is formed early and again in our mother's womb, um, nature turns off this ability to regenerate a tissue because it's done building the body, and uh, that is, I think, the other major component of aging. And the two together uh, are, uh, I think, the, the secret of the difference between animals that don't age and animals like us that do. So you think just by these two factors that uh, in the lab experimentally you said you've been able to reverse the aging of, of human cells? Yeah, and so you, we can restore them. We can reverse both of these things. We can turn telomerase back on and um, take cells you know, back to immortality, in a sense, back to the immortality of the germline of these reproductive cells and restore this regenerative potential. So what, where, I, where this is going, I think, is uh, a recognition that we can now explain um, multiple aspects of aging that people have been studying uh, before, you know, the, the, the tail of the elephant and the ear of the elephant. All of a sudden, we start seeing a unification of this understanding as to what's going on in the cell and in aging. But then also, as I said, uh, the recognition that if we can do this in cells in the laboratory dish, can we do it in the human body? Can we do it in people? And right. uh, that's a technological challenge, not unlike, I think, uh, some of the, your listeners may be uh, old enough to remember uh, President Kennedy saying, you know, let's go to the moon in the next 10 years. Um, right. The science was there, 
the engineering was not completely there. You know, we knew how to send somebody to the moon, right? I mean, we knew the physics. Um, you know, we knew how to, you know, the essence of how to to the liquid propellants and you know, the rocket, the rockets that would be used, how it would all work. Right. But you know, some of the alloys needed to be perfected. Some of the electronics had to be miniaturized so as not to be too big. There was a lot of engineering that took a lot of people. And translating this laboratory, these laboratory discoveries, into actually an FDA-approved, you know, drug uh, therapeutic strategy takes, you know, engineers. Um, well, why not? To, um, why not start with parts of a person? I mean, could you? Um you know, take someone's, uh, one of their organs and, I don't know, somehow take it out of the body, make it younger and put it back in. Is that ridiculous? I'll give you an example. Um, one example of that would be uh, take a cell. This is entirely um, doable today, although, again, requires FDA approval, but we know this can work. Uh, it's been done in animals. Uh, take a cell from your arm, let's say, Let's you know, take a little skin cell, or let's swab the inside of your cheek, you know, and take a cell from the inside of your cheek, blood cell perhaps, and then do what I just said. Let's transport that cell like we put it in a time machine back um, to the beginning of your life, or actually nine months before you were born, back to this these first few cells that formed your body. That, as I said, uh, can be done in a laboratory today. So then, is, is, is that making it a pluripotent stem cell, or is there yeah, another yeah. word for it? Yeah, it's, it's called induced pluripotency, and okay. um, it's widely studied today. And the fact that that reverses uh, aging is, uh, you know, increasingly acknowledged by not just aging researchers, but by scientists in general. So now let's take those cells that were identical to the ones that you were born from. We could do two things with them, theoretically, and I don't know anyone who has any intention of doing this. Theoretically, we could turn them into an identical twin of you. It'd be like cloning. And if we did, uh, the baby would be born young. But instead, that just is a you know kind of a example of what we have done had done here. But instead, let's do what you describe: make some young tissue in the body. And an easy example would be to turn them into uh, the uh, they what are called bone marrow stem cells or the blood forming stem cells. There's a cell that resides inside of our bone that uh, releases uh, fresh young uh, new uh, blood cells, the, the cells that bite, you know, infections, viruses, and things, and right. makes your red blood cells. And uh, we could replace the those cells with brand spanking new blood forming cells that you had when you were born. Um, there, there's not a lot of engineering. The science is there, and essentially the engineering is there. I mean, that could literally be done today if it was approved by FDA. Oh. And in some applications, uh, you know, there are patients that um, it's a matter of life or death. They really need those young blood forming cells today. Okay. But you know, the that's just the piecemeal approach. That's kinda like let's say you had an old, you know, model T car in your garage and, you know, never been worked on since uh, you know, the day it was uh, bought by some customer and you know it's covered up with a blanket, it's out in your garage and but you look at it and think, Oh darn, you know, that's kinda rusted out and the tires are all uh falling apart and everything else. We need some replacement parts to get this on the road. Well, we right. have replacement parts today. You can buy a lot of these old cars. Uh, you can buy, you know, uh, replacement parts that are pretty much like the original OEM parts and get the car back on the road. So conceivably, you could do this piecemeal approach with the with aging, and that would change aging dramatically, of course. As I said, giving people back young blood cells or new young heart muscle cells after a heart attack or new brain cells well, uh, for Parkinson's. Have we done Come this on. in animals? Have we done Hell this yeah. in animals? And well, humans. Okay. How about humans? So we sure. are we're making uh, young retinal cells for a problem in aging called age-related macular degeneration. I say we. Mm -hmm. Here I'm talking about uh, Ajax's parent company, Biotime, which is a 
public company, and we have a uh, product in human clinical trials uh, now where we put these young uh, cells into the eye to uh, treat this problem of the aging retina. It's the leading cause of blindness in an aging population. Yeah. And, um, you know, that, that's in human clinical trials right now as we speak. There are patients uh, being treated. Um, but, Are there any results yet, or was just out of curiosity? Yeah, you know, well, well, we're a public company, and so, you know, I can only say what we've said publicly, but the, we keep sure. making progress. Uh, we just recently advanced to a new, you know, it's kind of like climbing a, a ladder. You go through these steps with the FDA. We've just advanced. I mean, we announced in the last few days, you know, to a new group of patients uh, because we're uh, we're seeing good, uh, you know, as anticipated results and we're moving it forward. We hope to have it approved um, as fast as possible because few things are as devastating to anyone uh, as is blindness. You know, it's uh, yeah, yeah, it's really tragic, but, and 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 we know how to uh, address this problem. You know, I have a question. Um, what happens if you have a rejuvenated tissue inside of a, you know, of a creature that has aged tissues? Do they interact differently? That's do the brilliant. aged ones signal the younger ones, or vice versa? I didn't, I didn't know you were a scientist. That's a brilliant question, actually. Oh, thank you. So, um, right. I mean, you'd, you'd think yeah, the analogy I gave you of the car, you know, you, you put a new carburetor that was identical to the old carburetor in all practical respects. You unbolt mm-hmm. the old one, you put the new one on. Uh, things You wouldn't anticipate that the old car is anyway going to be a problem with having a new carburetor, it'll all be, it'll all be good, right? Um, right? And yeah, but the human body is much more complex, and the we've never done this before, you know? The history of mankind, we age on cue, we die on cue, it's just the way it's always been. Putting, uh, you know, young retinal cells into an old eye uh, has never been done. And so we've thought long and hard about this, um, and, you know, bottom line is um, we, it's like the, uh, again, I'll use this analogy of this of going to the moon, you know, back in the 60s. Um, you, I don't know if you remember, it was, there was concern about landing on the moon, uh, how much dust there would be in the moon. And there was people concerned that the spacecraft, the LEM spacecraft would be buried in dust, you know, and would just disappear. Mm. Or, you know, there's, there's risks when you go and do something for the first time. And um, but those scientists, based on what they knew, felt that that was they 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 knew what that outcome was going to be. And and indeed, they had a safe right. outcome. And I guess that's kind of like where we're at here. Without going into all the science, uh, we think we have reasons to believe this is going to be um, a very effective thing for the retina, but for also for many other uh, problems of aging. And um, but ultimately, it will have to all be tested in clinical trials. Yeah, I could see. Let's say you, uh, you know, grew a new heart and put it in someone, a young heart. Would the tissues around it make, you know, quickly accelerated up to the same chronological state as they are? Would the young heart make the other surrounding tissues younger? Yeah. Would there be no effect between the tissues? It's just be, yeah. you know, I, I, certain parts of you, if they were made younger too, it could strain the other parts, and the other parts couldn't keep up. So That's I wonder, right. you know, when You're you say all- about. Or- very interesting. Very something new. Yeah. What you know? What if you uh, maybe the the key would be instead of giving someone a brand new spanking X Y or Z, to give them one that's slightly less aged, so it the system doesn't yeah. blow up. Yeah. Make it work you together. Go. You know. I like that idea. Well, the we but like I said, we there's you know uh, like this people that sent the Apollo astronauts to the moon. You know they had they had data. And uh, we have data. We know already that if you put a, um, there's ways of measuring the age of cells very precisely. Um, If you give me some cells from virtually any place in the body, um, we can tell you within a a couple years, maybe three years, uh, how old the donor, the person was. You know, it's very precise. And if you put young uh, blood forming cells, into an old person, uh, they remain young. They they are not suddenly turned old by the body. And so, you know, there, there mm. we have data on this. Yeah, that's the piecemeal approach. Can we do more right, than right. that? 
the, the if we as a staggering as it sounds, that we can really reverse the aging of human cells back to the beginning of life. You know, doggone it, isn't there a way to do this even more profoundly in the human body? And we think so. And that's really the reason uh, we formed this uh, subsidiary of Biotime called Ajax, um, like SpaceX, you know, uh, mm-hmm. inspired by, I guess, the, the uh, space yeah, race. Peter Diamandis. Yeah. And, uh, and Elon Musk, perhaps. And, um, mm-hmm. and uh, that's why we formed the company is because we believe that uh, there's, you know, we, we've grasped this more unified theory of aging, and we do believe that it's possible to in, induce uh, this phenomenon in the body. We call it induced tissue regeneration, or ITR is our, our name for it. And, um, you know, it's very imaginative. For, for some time, we kept it quite secret in the company. We've been talking about it. There's a few videos here and there on the Internet where I talk about it. And right. um, and so, you know, what I'm, I guess, predicting for the future is um, not only some pretty significant science in the coming months and years uh, being published in the literature, but some pretty significant medical advances in terms of actual therapeutic development as well. There's a lot of implications for that. You know, I guess a simple way to put it is that even a good thing and what happens then if, uh, you know, for new generations and I mean, there's all these, the whole slew of ethical and moral considerations with even doing that, even if you could. Well, that's right. Uh, years ago, um, back when, you know, we, we've been pretty um, aggressive at advancing, you know, moving this rock uphill. And some of the work required, um you know, years ago when I was at Geron, we isolated the human embryonic stem cell. You may remember um, President Bush talked to our country about this. And um, and then we did work on uh, at another company I was at on uh, human therapeutic cloning. You may remember that debate. Mm-hmm. Um, I and my team were the ones who, who worked on that and, again, got in trouble with President Bush over that. And uh, what we were trying to do is show that we could make this time machine work. We saw the egg cell as a like a time machine. The way cloning works, of course, now a somewhat antiquated technology. Um, you take a, a cell from the body, an old cell, and put it into an egg cell, and the egg cell looks acts like a time machine. It transports that cell back in time. So you could make a baby of a very, you know, very old person. The baby would be identical and would be, but would be made young again. And we demonstrated that actually in the year 2000 in a paper we published in Science. And uh, be, because of the controversies about cloning and, uh, you know, uh, embryonic stem cells and so on, um, uh, the actually the chair of... President Bush's Ethics Commission, Leon Cass, uh, wrote a piece uh, in the New York Times, and he uh, vociferously opposed not just um, research on embryos, but he opposed any uh, intervention, as I heard him, uh, in human aging. His point of view was that aging and death are a good thing, whether we realize it or not, and that we were, you know, sort of going back to the tree of life and and grabbing that apple. You know, we didn't have any right to extend human lifespan or to tinker with the aging process. Mm. Um, I appreciate debate, and I appreciate his point of view, but I couldn't be more passionate in my disagreement over this. In my mind, uh, any of us that have been to a nursing home and seen you know, loved ones in the nursing home uh, with, with Alzheimer's disease, you know, are incapacitated yeah. from from heart failure or seen a young child with a terrible body burn, you know, where the skin can't regenerate and on and on and on. I mean, you know, we'd talk all day about these, un, you know, unsolved medical problems associated with aging or not that cause so much debility and suffering for our loved ones. To say that we're afraid that we, you know, might be um, doing something wrong 
to me is well, I'll use a biblical analogy if you don't mind. Um yeah, there's no a parable in the Bible where uh Jesus gives the or the master rather gives he told the story but master gives out these coins these gold coins and says go make me a profit. If you remember the parable, um, all of them make a nice profit for the master. One of them says, look, I was afraid of doing wrong, and I buried the cold gold coins in the ground so no one would steal them. But I was afraid of you, and uh, so I, I hear, hear your coins back. And the Bible, Jesus, called him wicked and slothful. And I would argue, you know, from a... Uh, Christian moral point of view, or certainly from a uh, Judaic point of view, or Islamic point of view, or just an agnostic and atheistic point of view. I think we all understand that um, our duty uh, as human beings and responsible stewards of what we do in our science and our technology is to uh, alleviate suffering in our fellow human beings the best we know how. And, uh, you know, and that's really the goal of modern gerontology. It's not to extend lifespan for the sake of living longer. It's to extend health span, you know, to increase the number of years where we can enjoy life, uh, that we're free of debilitating disease. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll debate you know, the Leon Casses of the world all day long on this point. We need courage. Some people say we're creating a brave new world. I think we need to be brave, and I think we need a new world. You know, we need a new and better world. And I think we know how to do it, and we're quite headstrong well, in making that happen. Yeah, I mean, you, you don't have to necessarily make people immortal. You could, I mean, this would be debated, I'm sure, for a long time, but it could be like uh, medical marijuana. You know, it could be yeah. uh, selectively applied to people that are, you know, in horrible shape. Uh, it could be applied in certain ways and not in other ways. So it doesn't have to be all or nothing. Let's start with, you know, the ravages of Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or the pain of arthritis, you know, osteoarthritis. No, you're right. There's a joke in aging research about um, a student uh, comes to his, you know, graduate advisor and he says, uh, I've got good news and bad news. Uh, and he says, well, let's start with the good news. He says, well, what is that? He says, well, the good news is we've found a way to make humans immortal. Well, that's wonderful news. What Then what's the bad news? Well, it'll take forever to test it. <laughs> and yeah, and so uh, immortality is never achievable. You know, you, uh, how do you ever? Yeah, by definition, you never right, reach right, the end. Right, right, right. But yeah, um, you know, I, 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 and I think most aging researchers really don't go there. Um, not just because uh, we would stretch the credulity of modern aging research, but just because we're, you know, we're focused on the goal before us. You know, we've got, it's a lot of work to uh, decipher this riddle of aging, and it's even more work to turn even some of the simplest discoveries into actual products that can be approved by FDA and uh, made available to the public at large. You know, we have rigorous tests nowadays to demonstrate safety uh, and efficacy. Uh, these are really um, rigorous hurdles FDA puts in front of any responsible uh, biotech company. And, uh, you know, it's, our goals are the hurdle right before us. And uh, talking about immortality, of course, is uh, an infinite number of hurdles downstream. We're not quite focused on that. But I have uh, one question. It's a science question that goes back a few minutes. Um, you said you can tell the age of cells um, given to you, you know, in a sample. I, I was wondering, um, in a human body, like in my body, you know, I'm 42. Are all my cells the same apparent age, or do you see in people or animals that some cells in their body are younger than other ones, or is, are they all kind of the same? I was just curious. About yeah, that. most of those studies uh, where we biomarkers of aging have been worked out are with, um, you know, a, a bunch of cells together. Most of them require like a blood sample. So you're looking at thousands mm. of cells. And um, and with those cells, you can uh, predict a person's age you know, quite precisely, as I mentioned. Um, and it'll work with skin cells or brain cells. Most of us don't want to part with our brain cells. And, you know, um, people say, oh, uh, you know, it's just a, a phrase that, oh, he's got a young heart or he's got an old soul. 
Is that actually true? Do people have young and old parts of their bodies? Well, I, I know it's true. Um, you can tell. Um, so, you know, I, I mentioned it earlier in our discussion about how cells in our body can only proliferate a, a certain number of times and then they stop, right? And that's due to this telomere uh, shortening for the most part. And uh, so cells lacking telomerase, the immortalizing enzyme. So the, the fuse burns down, telomeres shorten, and we can measure that. And when cells reach the end of that thing, we call it the Hayflick limit, after Dr. Hayflick, who discovered this, uh, the cells get really big, and they change in ways that are easily recognized if you're hmm. you know, a person that, like me that stares at cells through a microscope all the time, and um, easily recognized. So years ago, I'll give you an example. Back when I was a, a student, uh, I had a technician working with me. And I said, um, yeah, let's do an experiment, kind of a fun experiment. Um, the, we have a National Institute on Aging, and uh, you get from their skin cells from every decade of life, uh, you know, so like seven years of age for the first decade, and then all the way up to the 90s and the 100s, and um, mm -hmm. take pictures of them and hand them to me coded, you know, so I don't know what they are. And I'm going to look at them and see if I can. Uh, tell what the age they are. And what I was looking for was these large senescent cells. And, you know, if the culture or the picture of the cells had none of those, I would attribute the cells as being very young. And if it was full of them, I would attribute it to them being very old. So I numbered them. And then she gave me the code. And I had them in exactly the right order. Hmm. Number one right. was the youngest, the first decade. Number two was the second decade. And that's just yeah, so you can see this process occurring in the body. Um, not all the cells from an old person are old, though. And uh, so what we believe is even if 10% of the cells in your body uh, are, have reached this Hayflick limit are old, they can have very deleterious effect. Uh, I think I mentioned the time bomb. You know, it's like a time bomb. They They sort of explode. They don't explode, but they... They do damaging things. They're sort of an inflamed, angry cell, and uh, they destroy tissue. And um, and so, right, so not all the cells in our body um, become old, but enough do that it causes our skin to lose elasticity, you know, and um, become thin. The skin on the back of your hands can become so thin. With In very old people, you can see, you know, the blood vessels under the skin and so on. It's all part of this. So could you could you identify the the oldest part of a person and rehab that? And do you think that would that would that might extend their life? It sounds like because it would the thing that could cause the most damage would be uh, rejuvenated. Yeah. Maybe that's a, a way forward. Yeah. Right. So one of the, that's that's again very prescient on your part. Um, medicine's really gravitating in this direction of precision medicine. So, um, you know, if you have a cancer, identifying uh, exactly, not just that you have breast cancer, but is the cancer going to be responsive to this or that drug by using, you know, modern DNA sequencing technologies and so on. And uh, although we're not there right now, uh, at least in the United States, in terms of treating the problems of aging, um, the pressure on our society over the costs of dealing with an increasingly older population are, are significant, to say the least. Um, we have trillions of dollars of expenditures coming uh, to take care of the aging baby boom population. So, and we have no, there's no budget for this in the United States. It's a really dire mm. uh, scenario we're facing. We, we haven't planned for 76 million boomers growing old. The surge of the number of elderly and the number compared to the number of young people, uh, you know, putting in money into Social Security or Medicare um, or into our government's coffers, uh, that ratio has shifted really profoundly. And so there's going to be a lot of pressure to um, to deal with the problems of aging in a very precise manner. And one of them will be, as you described, identifying using advanced diagnostic techniques, uh, what is the immediate challenge this patient's facing? You know, if it's heart failure, uh, 
maybe they have prostate cancer. A lot of prostate cancers, in age, if they occur in aging, have a very slow course in aging. You know, they're really not life-threatening over the next 10, 15, 20 years. So let's hold off on that right now and deal with the heart failure. And that kind of precision right, right. approach to gerontology is, is almost certainly uh, the future of gerontology or geriatrics, which is the you know medical practice of treating aging patients. Yeah, this is so fascinating. I mean, there's so many facets to this. It's, it's amazing. It's um, if if you knew what we knew, and mm-hmm. if your listeners could come and just look over our shoulder and see what we see in the laboratory every day. I've often felt that um, any such person would could hardly think of anything else. Uh, I think probably, you know, you probably have guests on your show that talk about collecting insects or, you know, uh, remodeling right. rocking chairs, or you, have, you, do, you talk about all kinds of things, and everyone's probably excited about their own thing. But mm, right. to me, the, uh, the legacy... When history in the future looks back in time at our, at our generation in these years, I think in the future what they'll look back and say, you know, yeah, the year 2018 to 2025, that's when everything changed. For the first time in the history of mankind, we really understood the biology of human mortality. And, huh. and can you imagine the day? Back in those days, people just accepted they all buried one another in the ground and their loved ones and said goodbye, and that was the end. And uh, things are going to change, and uh, it's an exciting time. And uh, there's, you know, hopefully the the public will enjoy watching the fruits of this research, which has been done both in the private sector and companies, you know, biotech companies are funded by private and, of course, public funding through uh, the stock market. And then, and of course, we have the National Institute on Aging and the National Institutes of Health that for uh, years have seen the wisdom of funding uh, basic scientific research in this field, which is now beginning to uh, bear fruit. Well, you know the old joke about aging, it never gets old. Yeah. That and, joke. Uh, it's my joke, hope, actually. Uh, hopefully, joke. hopefully the, they will grow old and will disappear from the face of the earth. Keep your fingers crossed. Well, so what are the um, products that Ajax is coming out with or working on? You talked about young retinal cells. What else is in the hopper there? Yeah, that, that's actually our parent biotime. Uh, so what we've done is we made over uh, these pluripotent stem cells that are um, have telomerase, and so they maintain themselves in actually in a mortal state. But then when you make cells from them, uh, they're very young. And uh, we can make any cell type of the human body on an industrial scale with this. We've made over 200 different cell types of the human body. That may sound like a lot, but there's actually thousands of different cell types in the human body. And um, But we've already made 200 of them, and we looked at uh, them uh, with all these modern you know, DNA techniques, and um, said, well, okay, so we could make kidney cells, you know, we could make heart muscle cells. Uh, what? What? It's like a tree. Imagine a tree with a bunch of apples on it, and you're saying um, there's this enormous market of unmet need uh, in aging. People need placement heart cells, desperately so. Uh, they need new blood-forming cells, uh, desperately so. What, which of these apples do we pick? Because, you know, our basket here that we're going to put them in is not very big. Biotech companies uh, like Ajax, uh, you know, are operating on small budgets. Um, may sound like a lot to some listeners, but, you know, a few million dollars a year is really minuscule when, when you all the work you have to do to get FDA approval. So we decided hmm. we could do three things, at least with the, you know, the resources we have. And we picked three apples off this tree the low-hanging fruit. Uh, we thought these are opportunities in aging uh, that are big, and um, we felt that we had a very strong competitive stance on them, and they weren't about to be solved by any other means in medicine. So we picked these three. One is in aging, uh, your metabolism gets thrown off, as you know. Uh, we all know. Uh, so you could eat a lot of ice cream when you're young, but when you do that in middle and old age, you start accumulating fat around the waistline and, unfortunately, fat around the coronary arteries. You know, that's these plaques you hear about, coronary disease. 
it's fat built built up there. And uh, why is that? You know, what, what gets thrown out of balance? Why does your metabolism change? Well, we've learned a lot. Yeah, I wonder about that. that uh, I wonder that a lot of times. Yeah, what's I'm the same person, but yet I'm not. So yeah, what's, what's your answer for that? Yeah, I know, I know. So what we've learned that we uh, people who work in this field have learned is that there's a dramatic loss of a type of cell that was just really underappreciated. They're called brown fat cells. They're think of them as the opposite of normal fat. Normal fat, of course, you eat a a lot of calories, and fat stores up calories for future use in case you were, you know, in the old days, uh, you know, you're in a stone age and there are no more antelope to shoot or with your bow and arrow and you were hungry, you lived off the fat for a while. Right. So normal fat stores calories for future use. Brown fat does the opposite. It burns calories like crazy, and it does it to generate heat. So it's a way of the body it warms itself. And you have a lot of brown fat as you're young, and you lose it precipitously in age. And uh, so now, uh, mostly diabetes researchers have been studying this because the loss of brown fat in animal models, you know, if you take the tissue away, they become obese and diabetic, and you give the tissue back, and they trim back up and become insulin sensitive again. So there's strong reasons to believe that the... um, manufacturing brown fat and restoring your metabolic balance could be very beneficial in uh, people. And in aging, it's estimated that up to half of all the boomers, all the baby boomers, are going to be at least pre-diabetic in the coming decades. They certainly have a weight problem in the United States. So that's a really big opportunity. We're making those cells uh, for, you know, the requisite work to get into human clinical trials. A second thing, the number one killer is cardiovascular disease where you're not getting enough blood flow to your heart or other tissues in the body. And we uh, know how to make uh, very young vascular cells to sort of replumb an organ, to give it back vascular support. Uh, And we're making those cells similarly, uh, you know, gearing up for human clinical trials in, in the future. And then last of all, the most imaginative of all possible things, which we started out our conversation talking about, is could we find a way to do this in the whole body, reverse the aging of cells and restoring the regenerative potential of cells in the body? We call that induced tissue regeneration. And we have a program here working on, uh, it'll be a cocktail of drugs, kind of like the not the same molecules, but kind of like this cocktail that end up effective in treating uh, HIV or AIDS. Right. So it was a combination of drugs. We um, were working on a uh, mixture of drugs that we believe can restore uh, this primitive state to cells that allow them to regenerate and potentially uh, regenerate endlessly. We call it induced tissue regeneration. It's a very sort of you know, Star Wars approach to aging, but this is where we believe uh, the field is going to be focused in the coming decades. Well, it actually sounds like you you would administer that, but then you'd have to administer something to stop it, or someone could. It'd be crazy. Imagine someone ages backwards so much that they yeah, become, kind of like uh, Benjamin uh, Button. Yeah. So the yeah, well. uh, almost certainly, you know, FDA's um, looking at allowing a clinical trial where the endpoint is aging itself. There's a drug called metformin, which uh, is useful in treating diabetes, and there's you know, the gerontology community is thinking, you know, this isn't the most potent of things, but it, based on some animal work, it looks like it could uh, slow aging, and FDA is willing to consider. FDA, by the way, we all pick on, on the agency, but you know they try very hard to help people. You know, they're people too. And uh, yeah. but but um, yeah, you you hit the nail right on the head. Almost certainly, even technologies that are designed to reverse aging will be initially developed as products to treat the aging of some specific tissue in the body. It's just hmm. smart. It's smart to when you have a public company to have a more near-term 
you know, h- higher probability of success indication where you're saying we're going to use this in in heart failure or some specific uh, clinical application. And then with time, the indication can be broadened out um, for other things in the body and maybe someday for the for the entire body. I guess there'd be a temptation for one night in the lab for you to inject yourself, you know, <laughs> with this cocktail. <laughs> well, I, I look at myself in the mirror every day, and I yeah, I keep I keep being tempted by that. But uh, there have been. I'm not uh, saying you're old. I'm just saying you know anyone would be tempted. I would think of any of most ages. Uh, thank you, thank you for clarifying the point. Um, sure, I mean yeah, you know, but I'll tell you something. Um, I guess this is kind of a personal point, but you know years ago. Um, I uh, envisioned the day. It was just sort of a flash of insight. Um, not of myself being old, but uh, I was just, you know, it's the funniest thing. I was sitting in my hometown. Gosh, this must have been 1980 or something, or before. And uh, I was sitting having lunch across from our hometown cemetery. And kind of like at a flash of insight, I saw the sunrise on a day when all of my loved ones, the people I care for in this world, would be buried in that cemetery and their names written on those stones. And the r- rage I felt, you know, uh, the conflict between our love for a fellow human being and aging and death is what's driven me all these decades to focus on this. I've, I've thought about that motivation, I would say, every day of my life since. How wow. often I think about myself in aging you know, you brought it up today, but it's the first time I've thought about it in a, in a few months. Um, sure. It sounds awfully altruistic, but, you know, I think maybe if, if we think about it, you know, the the death, our own death, we won't be aware of it. But it's very painful to lose someone very close to you. And um, yeah. to me, that's that's really the motivation, and um, you know. But sure, uh, you know. They always. I, I'm reminded by friends. Yeah, but Mike, I because I, I've said this to my friends at times that I, yeah. I really don't take care of myself. I think about the what we're trying to do for other people. But they say, yeah, but when the plane's going down, they remind you grab the oxygen for yourself first, and then help your your child sitting next to you, and um, right. uh, we, we do need to be uh, thinking about this as individuals. But um, the goal, as I said, of modern aging research really is, for the most part, most of the people I know of in the field, it's quite humanitarian. You know, we're really trying to make the world a better place uh, for all of us. Well, very good. I, I, I really appreciate you opening up, and um, yeah, I'm sorry we're out of time and everything, but th- this is amazing, and you're doing good work. And, you know, I just, I guess a bit of unasked for advice, you know, you do need to... Uh, Keep yourself at least in a moderately healthy state, and you're better able to help others and better able to do your work. So I know you're not asking for advice, but uh, I guess that's my advice to you: is being altruistic is great and important, and you're doing really great work and important stuff. But you know, take care of yourself at least some, so that you're able yeah, I, to keep I, doing this. You know, I, I appreciate that, and it's, it's a lot of fun talking yeah. about this uh, this exciting science. Well, very good. So, uh, what's the best way for people to find out more about Ajax and to you know, get in contact? Yeah, we have a channel on YouTube. Um, I, I, for those that are interested in, um, you know, some of the science, there's a video online called "The Future of Aging," which is a meeting I presented some of these ideas we've talked about today. And um, if, for those who are really serious about thinking about all the implications of this in terms of philosophy and science and the future of mankind. I, I made five videos, which are my own personal point of view. They don't reflect any company's point of view, called Back to Immortality on YouTube. It's a story okay. about how science learned to uh, take a cell, even an old cell, back to this immortal lineage of cells that make the body. And I talk about the future on the implications of all this uh, for you and me. Uh, back to mortality on YouTube. Okay. Well, very good. Those are good, good resources. Well, well, thank you for coming. It's been a great call, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Have a good day. Coming to Dallas, Texas, September 14th, 15th, and 16th, 2018, the Blockchain and Future Tech Expo. This is going to be a gigantic conference of over 5,000 people. We're going to be talking about blockchain and its applications. We're going to be talking about quantum computing, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, and several other future technologies that are poised to and actually changing our lives as we speak. Here's why you should attend. 
As you may know, early adopters are the ones that investigated and profited from things like the gold rush in the 1800s and the dot-com boom in the 1990s and the internet boom in 2005, from the smartphone explosion in 2007, from the real estate boom that ended in 2008, and of course, from the Bitcoin boom that started in 2012. Early adopters act now. They don't wait till later. They go out west first in their covered wagons. They find the biggest gold nuggets. If you consider yourself an early adopter and you want to find the biggest nuggets, then you owe it to yourself to attend this upcoming conference. Blockchain is going to affect how we control and store our medical data, how we send money around the world, how we bank, and more. But artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and cybersecurity will play a pivotal role in our lives as well. And that's why our next event, September 14th to the 16th at the Dallas Convention Center, is going to have not only 5,000 plus attendees, but will showcase blockchain, AI, cybersecurity, quantum computing, and more. You want to get in on the coming gold rush of future tech and opportunity as an early adopter. Don't be left out. To register, go to bftexpo.com. That's blockchainfuturetechexpo.com. Thank you. You have been listening to Almost Here, Around the Corner of Future Technology podcast with Richard Jacobs. Subscribe to this podcast, post to review, to discover more future technologies that are poised to transform our lives for better or worse, such as Bitcoin, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more.